Good afternoon, everybody. I am Effie Pilarinu, and you know, if I had a D title from some country, I would be decentralized finance. <laughs> I mean, I guess these days it might be be a, a bad word, you know, after the the blow up of um, of Terra, but. Um, I think, uh, as we heard before, that there's a lot of learnings there, and our industry is here to stay and innovate continuously. And we'll be discussing about the value that has already been unlocked in terms of innovation because of DeFi, and then, of course, discuss where we're at today and some of the challenges and opportunities ahead. I'm, I'm joined by Aiton Katz, if I pronounced it correctly, co-founder of Diversify, which is um, a, a startup, I guess, in the blockchain space, focused very much on cross-chain interoperability. You know, DeFi, what comes to mind? Is it really, for most people, all about the yield? Uh, you know, the, the farming, the staking, the this, the that. Is that the case? Is that the whole innovation or the impression that it has left or the attraction um, uh, for which people came to, to, to play, to, to become users, early adopters? If that's the case, yes or no, what is your opinion? I can start. <clears throat> so... I would like to take a step back and look at the role of uh, speculation in general. Uh, so we see it a lot in DeFi and we think, okay, DeFi equals speculation and that's all uh, there is to it. And we, when we look historically even at uh, various uh, innovations in the past, um, let's take the internet for instance. The uh, first drivers, the early adopters were speculators. Finance is a big driver to move forward very powerful forces. So I don't think that DeFi is any different. So we see speculators taking a big role in uh, moving this uh, space forward, putting a lot of uh, money and investments. And I think that in a historical perspective, it's a good thing. Now, as for the question, is it all there is to it? Absolutely not. Uh, DeFi is building um, an alternative infrastructure that doesn't only copycats the uh, existing financial uh, system. It creates a lot of innovation that is stemmed from technology, very cutting edge new technology, as well as fundamental, even philosophical concepts. Composability is a powerful uh, uh, concept that is basically the heart of DeFi. So if someone is innovating with a new asset class or a, or a primitive, a financial primitive, anyone can take this without asking for permission and build on top of it and on top of it and on top of it. And we're, we're seeing this uh, a tremendous Lego that uh, we build here. And sometimes some of the bricks fall but the construct uh, is getting more and more uh, uh, strong and powerful. Ethan, I want to ask you, as you are more focused on, on the cross-chain interoperability, and maybe you tell us a little bit uh, about D Diversify, but I'd like to hear your perspective on how fragmented is the DeFi space like at a certain you know if we take a look at it and how you you are working to sort of address this issue <clears throat> so um first of all when you need to ask the question is fragmentation bad maybe it's how much fragmentation first of all <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay so so we talked uh, earlier we have a uh, uh, cust custody uh for your customers and your uh, bank uh, so we're talking about adoption. And if we look at uh, uh, what are the uh, blockers for adoption, one of them is interoperability. If we take, for instance, uh, for just for a second, the uh, uh, point of view of the end user, uh, they mostly, especially the masses, when we go to 
uh, mass adoption, they don't care about the specific attribute of the specific blockchain. They care about functionality, they care about value that they can get from these services. And in order to really get into that, we really need access to uh, this uh, 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 overarching set of capabilities that multiple blockchains offer us. Uh, so from an application perspective, if we look at this from a layered or stack perspective, uh, the application would need to get access to liquidity whenever, wherever uh, it resides. So, and that's not the case today. Um, the blockchains are ecosystems and they're siloed. And there's very little, by design, very little that is being baked into the uh, level ones, the, the blockchains, that takes care of uh, interoperability uh, between the multiple blockchains. So this is why we need another layer of solutions uh, that this is what we build, basically a layer that enables that kind of interoperability, specifically uh, uh, and allowing liquidity to move between multiple blockchains. Um, so... Uh, G give us an example, maybe, of using, yeah. you know, one or two specific names in the DeFi space of, of liquidity pools or liquidity... Yeah, uh, so I, I can give you an example, very close example, because before we did what we're doing today, uh, we pivoted uh, actually into solving this problem, uh, which was our problem. We were an application that tried to address financial risk. And uh, one of the ways to address financial risk is to use derivatives. So if you want to hedge, if you want to uh, uh, protect yourself and use hedging, you need the derivatives in order to do so. So we spoke uh, to multiple projects, for instance, uh, DeFi project on the Solana blockchain, and we understood that we need to give them access to uh, um, options and, uh, and future contracts and there were no uh, such primitives available in the Solana, uh, on the Solana blockchain. So we needed to get access to those on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, so if you really want to uh, uh, provide some functionality, uh, uh, you cannot expect one blockchain to provide everything. This is why we have multiple blockchains. Every blockchain has some kind of a different uh, a use case or set of use cases and attributes. Uh, so uh, we decided to solve that problem and we pivoted uh, to provide that layer, this pipe that enables access to liquidity on multiple blockchains. And we believe, we firmly believe that this is one of the drivers, interoperability will bring more adoption. As again, as we talked about the internet, think of the internet as a set of silos. It's unthinkable, it's beyond the uh, whole concept of the internet. And this is how we see DeFi, it should be connected. But you're really talking about interoperability and not talking about creating uh, standards that can work across all these different blockchains. Correct, our, our approach is different. We do accept the uh, specialization of blockchains, but uh, we, we think that as long as there are native tokens that uh, are developed and implemented on a blockchain, there needs to be access to them from any other blockchain. So we're not, our solution is not about, okay, let's set a lingua franca, let's set, create the Esperanto of uh, crypto. That is for us a too uh, ambitious uh, kind of, uh, you need the, the uh, approval of everyone. And what we say is you don't need approval, you don't need the uh, uh, permission, let's create this pipe uh, that moves the native token or the value uh, that is more accurate to say, move a value from one blockchain to the other without even them agreeing on, on the protocol. We are the uh, protocol that uh, moves the value and it's a decentralized protocol. Okay, so I want to, to touch upon uh, security 
uh, related innovations that uh, uh, come from the DeFi space or, you know, even if we don't have any of them coming from the DeFi space, what is the DeFi space experimentation and, and what we're seeing today? What is it teaching us? What are our needs uh, going forward? This, this is a, a big uh, topic. Any thoughts on that? One more aspect is security. So we talk a lot when we say security, we talk a lot about cyber security, but financial security is as important, especially in DeFi. And many of the attacks that we see, uh, we call them hackers, but basically they're financial engineers, maybe sometimes amazing financial engineers that find the, the economic or financial loopholes and take advantage of them. So it's not only about you know, securing the premises and, and uh, the, the traditional types of security. We're talking about uh, a new type of security that we need to be minded. Are you talking about UST? <laughs> that, that, that is, so that attack was a financial attack initially, yeah, right? Indeed. We don't have a lot of time. I think we have five more minutes and I do want to touch upon DAOs uh, because that is really cutting edge innovation on the spectrum, sort of speak, and how that relates to DeFi because obviously it is related. How do you feel about that? Is there um, a similar much uh, less uh, level of confidence as to where we can go there. This is a huge topic of governance and, and in my mind, you know, it does relate to sustainability, to, to finance, to transparency and, and connecting these together. So how, how, what are you hearing? What are you feeling? Uh, this is not so much a technology, obviously, question. Right. Uh, it's, it's a, as you said, it's a governance question. Uh, now, so if we're talking about DeFi as, a, as an emerging space, very young, so DAO is even younger. And uh, uh, it, it's, it's also a matter of trends and fashion, like everything else. So a lot of the DeFi projects, they decide to become a DAO, but they're quite a few implications to such a decision. If you're uh, uh, giving away full control of everything uh, um, to the uh, community, quote unquote, then you can see uh, some problematic things. Uh, I'm not saying that the opposite, uh, full control mm -hmm. is the best solution. I think nobody knows. Uh, so first of all, we need to remember that DAO is not uh, a one size fits all. And it's not an, a, a panacea, an all-encompassing uh, solution for every problem in the DeFi space. Uh, we need to apply that very, very carefully and probably not on everything. Because the moment you give it away to the community, sometimes uh, 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 speculators and funds and various play players with very specific interests will step in and will use that as a platform to execute their own interests. So it's not always uh, uh, for the best of the community. Probably the, uh, the, there is some kind of a mixture, a combination. So I guess that giving away some of the decisions to the community makes a lot of sense, but still we don't want curve wars if, if you know what's happening with curve and the curve wars. Uh, uh, and, and these kind of uh, fights that sometimes may even uh, uh, hurt the cause that you started everything for. Um, so we need to take it very, very cautiously and uh, look at it uh, uh, on a case by case basis. I'd like to open it to the floor. We, we can take one question if there is. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a, that's a bit ambitious, but uh, definitely we are looking at a decentralized settlement layer. Whether it will completely replace everything else, I don't know. I don't think so. But I think there is a, there is an alternative, a decentralized alternative, to settle 
uh, uh, transfers of liquidity and assets between various silos. More efficiently, more cost effectively and faster, yes. So, so uh, you kind of uh, gave my part 50% of my pitch because this is, these are the problems that we're trying to solve. It's not just uh, the uh, uh, bridging, it's the security of the bridging and also the capital efficiency because we use liquidity pools for that. Uh, so we need also to uh, create a, a, a high capital efficiency for the liquidity providers. So uh, we, that's, that's basically our claim to fame is the uh, security layer and the capital efficiency uh, combined. This is basically what sums up our solution. But, but the, you're right, uh, I wouldn't say that we will never be hacked. Uh, that such thing doesn't happen. But uh, what we are doing, we are learning from the uh, flaws of other protocols and implementing uh, solutions to those flaws. So we had three sessions about finances in general, CBDCs, the future of money, and now DeFi. And um, I kind of never heard these two words together, and I just want to throw it, them at you and tell me if they make sense together. And if so, what do you understand by them? Programmable and money. So we had uh, about programmable money. It's, it's, it's uh, uh, like a, uh, you know, nuclear, technology. It can be used for good purposes. It can be used for very bad purposes. It depends what you program into the money. You can uh, bake into currency uh, sustainability. So you can automatically offset the carbon footprint of every action that you do, baked into money. And you can use that to control people and track what they're doing and, and uh, uh, impact the uh, civil... <laughs> I didn't say that, but uh, it, it really depends what you do with the programming, what you bake into the money.